Thanks, man. Uh, yeah, so Cheesy, if you see him, give him a big hug. He's a little furry guy, wears his furry hat on his face. Um, he, he did a lot of the leg work as well in, in gathering speakers. Uh, really what Cheesy and I, you know, when Bart and Matt asked us to, to look into planning speakers for a, a developer-focused portion of the path to agility, all that we've done as developers at heart has been try to find people that we like to see speak. Um, and at the top of that list, you know, this year is Neil Ford. Uh, Neil does a really, really good job talking about, you know, kind of complex problems and, and situations and environments, uh, but he does it in, in a way that's, you know, really accessible and entertaining. Um, I've seen Neil speak, you know, all the way back to, to no fluff just stuff. You know, not to date Neil, but probably like nine years ago or eight years ago. Uh, we're both old. Um, so Neil does a really good job. We're excited to have him here. Uh, he works for ThoughtWorks. He really travels the world uh, doing coaching and presentations and training. So with that, Neil Ford. All right. Thank you very much. Let's plug this in. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. My talk this morning is entitled Abstraction Distractions. And it's called that because as developers, we spend our whole lives living in layers of abstractions. It's really the only way we get anything useful done because if you always thought about your computer as having a platter in it with rust on it that spins and a head that reads either one or zero, if you were programming at that level all the time, you'd never get anything useful done. And so what we've done over time is build up these layers of abstraction so that we don't have to think about all those low level details all the time when we're coding and when we're working with our computers. And in fact, we have these beautiful folders and files and these wonderful metaphors, but then one day you're coding along, and fortunately that doesn't happen much anymore, you're coding along and you get the dreaded blue screen of death. What's your first thought when you get the blue screen of death? How much have I lost? When was the last time I saved something? Because all your metaphors just disappear suddenly. It's what Neil Stevenson, the author, calls metaphor shear. You're comfortable in your metaphors, everything is working, and all of a sudden it goes away. And that illustrates what I'm referring to as an abstraction distraction. Because we live in abstraction so much, we start trusting them as the real thing, and then we're annoyed and surprised when they turn out not to be the real thing. And we start treating them as if they're one solid thing and not layers of abstractions. That's what causes problems. And I'm going to give you illustrations and solutions to this problem all through this talk this morning. But before I do that, I want to talk about a much, much more important problem. Because I'm guessing that all of you, just like me, are the IT support staff for your household. So my wife has over a terabyte of digital photos. And it doesn't matter if a meteor comes and strikes our house from, Earth, from outer space and destroys our condo, it's my fault if we have lost those digital photos because I'm the IT support staff for my house. And it got me to thinking about how do you really save things for a long period of time? So for example, my wife managed to come by this cake recipe that was a family secret and she finally, uh, I'm not gonna use the term waterboarding, but something along those lines to manage to get the Mary Long chocolate cake recipe and she has now tasked me as the IT support personnel to make sure this will survive any imaginable holocaust that might come up. And so I started thinking, how would you save this recipe for a hundred years in electronic format. Would you put it in a Word document? I don't know, a hundred years, maybe, you know, two years ago, it would probably been a no-brainer, but now it's like, I don't know, can we'll be able to read a Word document? Which version Word document a hundred years from now? I don't know, we're probably safer still going with just plain text. But now the question comes up, do we get fancy and go Unicode? Or do we leave it in the ASCII land? Because, you know, I'm pretty sure Unicode's gonna be okay, but you know, ASCII is probably even safer. And I might even get fancy and go something like HTML. Which is, of course, is still text-based, but has a little markup with it. 
This is a kind of a casual problem for me, but there are people who this is their job. And they're almost in a panic because the, the National Archives, they are tasked with keeping all these things that we are generating in a permanent storage medium. They're having a real problem doing this because storage mediums are going away really, really quickly now. And you may think this is a minor problem, uh, but a lot of people are thinking deeply about this. Uh, another group that's thinking about this problem is a group called the, uh, the Long Now Foundation. And they are working on a project called the Clock of the Long Now. And the, the question they're trying to answer is, can you build a clock that will last 10,000 years? Think about that problem for a second. A clock that keeps time for 10,000 years. Well, you can't base it on electricity because you can't rely on electricity. So this is actually one of the prototypes for it. This thing is 12 stories tall. It's run by water power uh, so that you, can, you put it near a river that you think is pretty geographically sound for the next 10,000 years and will have water flowing for 10,000 years to drive this thing. In fact, this group has... Uh, done some uh, purchased land to try to install one of these clocks. So this is some land in the American Southwest, which is geographically, geologically very sound. So imagine a giant clock right there. Uh, the famous musician Brian Eno has actually released a CD of bell studies for the clock of the long now. So they're figuring out how it's going to chime and how does it chime on the decade and the century and the, you know, the half century and et cetera. Uh, so there are actually some people doing some serious thought about this. But really, this problem is an example of what I'm calling an abstraction distraction. I really just want to save the knowledge, but I can't just save the knowledge somewhere. I always have to think about what physical format am I going to save this knowledge in. It should be completely abstracted for me, but it's still not. This is still something that we have to think about all the time because our abstractions are not clean enough to just say, oh, I can kind of save that and forget it. Which brings me to my first lesson which is don't mistake the abstraction for the real thing. That Word document is not actually the real thing, it's just the container for the real thing. This is an important concept because if there is a, a piece of software that is going to grow and to become Skynet, it is probably Emacs. And future historians are going to really be upset with us because the very first versions of Emacs, the very first check-ins, for the Emacs project still exist on tape, we just don't have a machine that can read them. So it's there, we just can't get to it anymore, and future historians are going to think we are irresponsible fools for taking this vital piece of programming history and just kind of ignoring it in the dustbin like this. So the next story I'm going to tell you is a, a real-world example of abstraction distraction. And there are two outcomes by the end of the story. One is that there was a strong possibility that I would have ended up in jail after this uh, incident happened, but I didn't, fortunately. It's also going to seem like one of those stories that somebody tells you that's way, way more detailed than it needs to be. But trust me, there's a level of detail here that is kind of required to get this story across. And it has to do with the job that I worked as I was going to university. And this is actually great advice for anyone who knows someone who's about to go to a university or looking for a fantastic job. I was the night auditor at a hotel while I went to university. And this is a fantastic job if you are going to school at the same time. Because in most hotels, you have a discrete list of responsibilities that the night auditor is responsible for. So this is the person that works the desk at night. And so you're responsible for the daily accounting. You balance the books for the day. And late check-ins, if anybody shows up at 3 a.m., you check them in. And somebody calls at 4 a.m. and wants something, you help them out. Uh, but there are two other things that are a vital part of this job that were emphasized really strongly when I was hired for this job. And those are don't get drunk and don't go to sleep. And they really emphasize these strongly as I was uh, looking for this job. And this is, in fact, just what makes it such a fantastic job if you're also going to university. Because there are, regardless of how much busy work the hotel tries to figure out for you, there are long swaths of time in the middle of the night where you have to entertain yourself. 
and you can entertain yourself by drinking or sleeping or by doing homework. And so my boss actually loved the fact that I was in university and knew exactly what I was doing overnight. That's when I was doing all my schoolwork. And the great thing about that, of course, is I can work and study at the same time. When I first got into the hotel business, it was on remarkably, ridiculously primitive kind of equipment, literally a manual cash register. It had electricity, but it had no intelligence whatsoever. It was really nothing more than an adding machine. And this is the way the hotel business worked back in those days. You had paper folios, and this was your state for your client, for your customer. And what would happen is you'd put it in the mechanical cash register and you would manually pick up the previous balance and then you would ring up charges for things like room charge and tax, for example. And then the cash register would generate the new balance based on the previous balance. But it's keeping no state for this person. It doesn't know anything about this person. It just knows how to add things up. And the way that you did the night audit for this system, the way that you balance the books for today, the day, was to take the sum that you'd added up under all the keys, because they sum up how much room charge, how much tax, how much restaurant, et cetera, and take the change from everybody's previous balance the day before and the new balance today and make sure those two things match, meaning that everything that you've added is added up to everybody's balance. So once you figured out how that works, it was sometimes tedious, but that's basically how not out it worked, and that's how you balance the books for the hotel. And in this manual system, there are really only a couple of things that can go wrong. As I said before, the hotel clerk is responsible for putting this piece of, piece of paper in and then manually replicating this number as the previous balance and then putting a new charge in, and then the cash register will calculate that new value. Uh, one of the two common problems is a person would go in and transpose the numbers when they put the previous balance in. And so you learn little auditor tricks like if the amount that you're out of balance is divisible by nine, then it's a transposition error. That's always the case that transposition errors always give you some a value that's off that's divisible by nine, so that's a handy trick. The other thing that would happen is there was nothing to make you color inside the lines on these. These were just pieces of paper. And so occasionally someone would get crazy and just stamp things all over it. And you had to kind of untangle this mess and figure it out. Uh, beatings would ensue the next morning for whoever was responsible for this. So this was a gradually self-correcting problem. But then I left that manual world and went to a hotel in Atlanta and went to Georgia State University. Uh, and it was this hotel, the Regency Suites Hotel, which actually is still there. And I was a young computer science graduate just moving to a big city. And their hotel system was computerized. Of course, made me very excited. And more to the point, this was in the late 1980s. It was computerized with an IBM PC AT, which was a 286 desktop computer with 640K of memory and a spacious 20 megabyte hard drive. And the software that these guys were running would actually run terminals off of this machine. And it was all written in basic with line numbers. So I was a young computer science student. I was impressed that they managed with basic with line numbers to get a multi-user system working that could run this entire hotel. Every once in a while, problems would come up and you'd see the source code and you know, kind of look at it. But you know, for the most part, it was pretty impressive. And the audit in the computerized world was completely different because it was running this long series of reports. It would post room and tax and these other things. And it would produce giant piles of green bar paper, which you had to file in big notebooks. That and then doing the manual backup of that 20 megabyte hard drive on five and a quarter inch floppy disks, that was the main part of your job overnight. Every once in a while, it would get out of balance. It always puzzled me when it happened because computers are supposed to be deterministic and the audit is a very deterministic kind of thing and every once in a while this thing would get out of balance and it would always puzzle me and I always wanted to do forensic engineering to figure out how in the world is this thing getting out of balance. And then one day I realized that the reason that it would occasionally get out of balance is even though they had set up this multi-user system with terminals on top of this computer, they had set it up 
with no locking, as in no locking, as in no locking whatsoever. My respect to them went from the highest mountain to the deepest valley instantly because these knuckleheads are selling software that's running a hotel with transactions that last one in wins. If two people open the same folio, then you're gonna get corruption and all these other nasty things about multi-user systems that they're selling it as a proper multi-user system. And so I very indignantly went to the manager of the hotel and explained this horrible situation. And she was like, so? She didn't really care that it didn't do proper concurrency because she didn't really understand the implications, and so I decided to illustrate it. So one night, late at night, while I was working in the hotel, someone came in late at night to rent a room, and they wanted to pay cash. So I took their money, rented them a room, and sent them on their way. I then went and started a night audit on one of the terminals, and while the night audit was running at a very particular point in time, went to another terminal, checked this person in, checked them back out, took the cash, put it in an envelope, put a date on it, put it in the safe, and then went home. The next day, the night audit was bizarrely out of balance by about one night's room and tax worth. And the accountant looked at it, and the comptroller looked at it, and they imported a guy from the knucklehead software company, and he looked at it, and he looked at it, and he looked at it, and that guy went away. I don't know whatever happened to that guy, but he disappeared after a while. Meanwhile, I was just standing around, kind of blissfully ignoring this, because I knew exactly what had happened. And after I let them stew for a week and try to figure this out, I said, oh, if you'll go to the safe and look in that envelope, you'll find exactly the amount of money that you're off. Let me demonstrate to you how someone who is unscrupulous could steal you blind by taking advantage of what we know in the computer science world as a race condition. That got their attention. Talking to them about race conditions and concurrency and other sorts of problems fell on deaf ears, but when I showed them that it was actually could potentially cost them a lot of money, that got their attention because, see, fundamentally they were suffering from an abstraction distraction. Because all the people I was working for had come from the manual world just like me. And they thought that the abstraction of folio in the computer was exactly the same as the physical folio in the real world. But it's not. It is an abstraction of that folio. And it turns out underneath you can do all sorts of non-folio-like things to that underneath because it is only a poor representation of that abstraction after all. Which leads me right back around to my lesson number one. Don't mistake the abstraction for the real thing. But this now brings up level num uh, my lesson number two. Which is always understand one level below your usual abstraction level. This is how I understood why it was broken. Because I understood how an audit works fundamentally. I understood what we were abstracting. And this is frequently the way that you solve a problem where some abstraction is broken or leaking is that you need to understand one level below what that abstraction is. And it's also kind of interesting to look at these two systems from a computer science standpoint because the first system was essentially stateless. The folio carried the state, that was the session state for the person, was that, that piece of paper, but the cash register itself was completely stateless, whereas the computer-based system was stateful. The manual system was very simple, whereas the computerized system was both essentially and accidentally complicated. It was complicated in both ways that software can be complicated. The manual system is by definition single-threaded, and the computerized system ended up being much more uh, problematic from a concurrency and multi-user standpoint. So sometimes simple things actually do uh, better jobs than more complex things. I realized this abstraction distraction thing fits in with cameras as well. Uh, back over Christmas, my nine-year-old nephew picked up my mother's SLR and went and shot a whole bunch of pictures and then was puzzled why he was in trouble for using up something called film. 
What is film? Why would you put something in a camera that you use up if you take pictures of the dirt and the sky and trees and stuff like that? It just seems like a really short-sighted design that there'd be some kind of consumable thing inside there. I realized this uh, about the same time that I watched TV differently than other generations of my family. I realized this at Christmas. Because I realized that even though I have a DVR and I've had a digital video recorder for many, many years, when I sit and watch TV, I will sit and wait until a commercial shows up before I get up and go to the restroom. I will sit in the chair and bounce my leg until a commercial comes up and then pause the DVR and then get up and go to the restroom. Because I've been trained my entire life, you go to the restroom when commercials come on. My mother, who's a generation older than me, doesn't believe that it happened unless you see it live. She has had a DVR and a VHS recorder for many, many years, and yet she will not miss TV shows when they live, air live. Even when I see her, you know, the three times a year I see her, she'll say, oh, well, you know, I've got to go upstairs because Law & Order is coming on. It's like, Law & Order? Well, we see each other like, you know, 20 hours a year, and you've got it, well, you know, it's coming on now. It's like, well, you could record. No, no, it's not the same. My nine-year-old nephew never thinks about anything coming on at any particular time. It's just always there. Uh, he probably has 40 half-paused movies on his iPad at any given time that he may or may not at some point get back to. My friend uh, Matthew McCullough had the same thing with his three-year-old daughter. They watch cartoons a lot on iPads, and he got up one morning and turned the TV on. Cartoons were on, and she came in and said, Dad, why did you start it without me? And he had to explain to her, no, I didn't start this one. Somebody else started this one far, far away, and I can't actually control that. And really what this points out to is that once internalized, abstractions are really, really hard to shake off. And if you don't think that's true, then just look down. This is not the most efficient way to type. This is not the most efficient keyboard layout. In fact, this keyboard layout was specifically designed to be inefficient in a very particular way. It was designed to make fast typists alternate hands as much as possible. Because when typing was invented, it looked like this. And you had these little arms that would fling up against a ribbon on a piece of paper to make a letter. And the two arms, if you were too fast, would jam up together. And then you'd have to use whiteout to correct the problem or an eraser. And so QWERTY was designed to make people alternate hands as much as possible. Dvorak is actually a much more efficient way to type. But if you think abstractions are easy to shake off, reteach yourself how to type. That is brutally difficult, and nobody's going to do it. And so we are still now, with computers, stuck with this purposely inefficient typing format because of mechanical arms. Which leads me to number four. Abstractions are both walls and prisons. Very often, abstractions look really nice because they save you from a chaotic world. An abstraction is a nice place to hang ideas and a nice organizing principle. But over time, those walls that are so comforting start closing in, and you realize at some point there's no door in that wall. I saw this as a great example of this in the UK. This is actually in a conference center in the UK. This is a sink designed by a person who's never actually washed their hands in a sink because you can get blazing hot water or you can get ice cold water and you cannot force them to mix together in the sink because there's no stopper here and so you are stuck. There are two pipes, therefore there shall be two spigots whether it makes sense to do that or not. Once internalized, abstractions are hard to shake off. I realized this back when Gmail first came out. Because just like many people at the time, I was a big Outlook user. And when Gmail first came out, I thought, these Google guys are so stupid. They don't know how to write a mail client. It doesn't even have folders in it. What am I supposed to do with all these emails? And so like many of you, what I did was go and replicate my folder structure that I had in Outlook, gradually piece at a time as tags in Gmail until one day it finally dawned on me, wait a minute, the tag thing is a way better way to organize your mail because you can tag two things at once. 
You can have as many tags off something as you want. There's no reason to put your email in a strict hierarchy. In fact, it makes no sense to force you to put your email in a strict hierarchy because there's not a hierarchical relationship the way you want to get back to that information. Tags make way better sense for that. And it got me thinking, are there other things that we're inadvertently cramming into hierarchies that would actually work much better as tags? And I realized this is one of those situations. The way we have life itself organized is in a strict hierarchy, and I think it would work way better with tags because if it did, we would finally be able to categorize this guy. Because this is a mammal that also lays eggs, and for some reason, only their left ovaries work. This is a bizarre thing about a duckbill platypus, this bizarre kind of leftover parts creature. We have a really hard time categorizing this in the biology world because they're trying to adhere to a strict hierarchy, and a lot of things don't really fit into strict hierarchies, including things like physical matter. This is a combination of uh, cornstarch and water, and when you vibrate it at a certain frequency, it has both the characteristics of a liquid and a solid at the same time. Even matter itself doesn't fit into a strict binary hierarchy because even matter itself, if you expose it to just the right things, will exhibit multiple characteristics at once. Abstractions are both walls and prisons. So let's go a little more to the computer science world. And I have a question for you. I'm sure many of you stare at this piece of software a lot. This is the, the ribbon bar from uh, Word. I have a really burning question for you. What the hell is that thing? <laughs> what is that? What was the last computer you had that had a floppy disk drive on it? So, okay, if that's the symbol for save, then what the hell does this mean? It's so big it needs to fit on multiple floppy disks? How did this ever come to be, to be save all? This is one of those mysterious things that a thousand years from now, people are going to say, Dad, what does that little symbol on the button mean? It's like, no, it just means save. You don't even need to know what that actually is because nobody will remember what that actually is. This is a classic example of an abstraction distraction because you're naming things for the underlying details. And that's actually my lesson number five. Don't name things that expose underlying details. Once upon a time, that was in fact a floppy disk that you save things, things to, but it has been a long, long time since you've done that and yet that icon persists. And I poke fun at Word, even my beloved Emacs, if you're foolish enough to turn on the little visual toolbar, has the same silly save icon in it, which is a floppy disk drive. I realized as well at some point that many of the things that we think are just a natural part of the universe are really just there as an abstraction to make you happier about things. Like for example, the file system. Nobody actually wants a file system. How many of you have been on a phone call with one of your relatives because you sent them a zip file of pictures and they have now downloaded it somewhere on their computer and you are now on a forensic hard target search with them via phone to try to find this mysterious file somewhere? Your grandparents don't want a file system. That just confuses them. That's purely just there for you lazy developers, for you to have some place to put all your junk. And I realized this by, when I read this really fascinating book called The Humane Interface by Jeff Raskin. He did a lot of early human-computer interaction research. And to give you a good idea of the kind of guy Jeff Raskin was, when he was born, his name was spelled the traditional J-E-F-F. -F. And when he became an adult, he legally changed his name to get rid of the extra inefficient F in his name. So that's the kind of guy Jeff Raskin was. And he talks a lot about the philosophical underpinnings of human-computer interaction. He brings up the point that users don't actually want file systems. They just want things that work. In fact, file systems confuse them. And in fact, what users want are consistent ways to interact with things. 
Back before Windows and back before graphical user interfaces, there were actually a huge number of different kinds of operating paradigms for computers. And uh, this was actually a fantastic piece of software. Be cautious if any of you react to this and recognize this. This is going to date you for a while. Does anybody recognize this, this piece of software? Yeah, a few people. This is Lotus Magellan, which was this really wicked cool file management utility back in the DOS days because it would actually index the contents of your documents and let you do full text searches, kind of the way that the, uh, the full operating system search things work now. This did this back in the ancient days of DOS, but very much like a lot of Lotus software at the time, it was very function key driven. It did not use the kind of Windows icon mouse pointer kind of metaphor. And when Windows came along, it ended up killing this piece of software off because there was just no way to get this metaphor mashed into that consistent metaphor that Windows imposed on everyone. And Windows and the Mac at the same time imposed this kind of sameness which is nice because then you had a consistency to applications. Every application had a file menu, they all had an edit menu and copy and paste lived in the same place, had the same shortcut keys. But remember, abstractions are both walls and prisons. The consistency that Windows and Macintosh forced on us was a great thing because it allowed people to be more productive right out of the box. But it also stifled a particular kind of innovation, which only recently has started showing up again in the form of iPads. This is the first computer that we've had in a couple of decades that didn't follow the standard, the standard kind of format for doing uh, computers. This one has no keyboard, it has no mouse, it has no file system, but we know that's a lie. There's a file system in there because ultimately at its deep, deep bottom, to get to the very bottom abstraction layers, it's a Unix running. But really notably, they never expose that file system to anyone but developers because end users don't want file systems, they want things that work. And the only way an iPad ever exposes a file system to you is from cloud-based services or something like that where you just need to facilitate sharing a document. Um, and each of those are doing that in a slightly different way. But this is the first real new UI metaphor that we've had in almost 30 years. And notice that this year is the year that tablet sales overtake desktop sales and mobile sales are vastly higher than either of those now. So this metaphor, is, uh, uh, this metaphor change is here to stay. And it's really hard on developers. A lot of developers don't want to see the file system go because that's a really good old friend. Um, and once internalized, these abstractions are hard to shake off and it's hard to give up this idea that you, know, you really don't have a file system and it's okay that you're not exposing a file system. But it's really amazing how much they get ingrained in the software world. How do these abstractions get so well ingrained and so defensible in the software world? There are a couple of reasons for this, I think. One of them is something that I wrote a blog entry about, which I call the suck-rock dichotomy. It seems like everything in the software world either sucks or it rocks, and there's nothing ever in between. There's a lot of passion on both sides of any argument. You can pick any kind of argument you want, IntelliJ versus Eclipse, or VI versus Emacs, or Linux versus Windows. I mean, there are all these camps. And everybody likes to cast stones at the other camp. And I think there are a couple of reasons for this. One is kind of the inherent tribal nature of people to gather with people that have similar interests and disdain people who have different interests. But I think the deeper reason for this is that learning a technology is a non-trivial investment and you want to have, have a good feeling that you made the right choice and you don't want to spend two years learning about something and then someone else come along and say, oh, you learned that, that was a big mistake, you sure to learn this instead. Your first reaction is to say, oh yeah, well I rock and you suck. And I think that drives a lot of these kind of um, suck rock dichotomy discussions. The other reason that these things get so ingrained and it's hard to shake them off has to do with something that Paul Graham talked about in his Revenge of the Nerds essay, which is what he calls the blub paradox. So he is imagining that you are working in an imaginary programming language called blub. 
And the blub paradox says that when you're a blub developer and you look down at the less powerful languages, it's very easy for you to enumerate why they are weaker than blub or not as good as blub. Well, blub has two of these and this one only has one of those and you have to do that crazy elaborate thing to make that happen over there and whereas in blub you can do this. When you look up at more powerful languages, you don't realize that it's more power, it's just weird syntax for doing the stuff you're already doing. And it's like, ah, I don't really care about that. Uh, I'm not that interested in it. And there's a great story that goes along with this uh, that illustrates the blub paradox, which has to do with uh, the very first build your own e-commerce site, which was via web. That is actually how Paul Graham made uh, his first set of millions of dollars. Uh, and what they did with via web is a very small group of developers, they wrote the entire thing in Lisp as a series of domain specific languages in Lisp. So they actually built their problem domain in their language. And all their competitors were writing things in languages like C and Perl. And Paul Graham said that when he was the CTO of ViaWeb, he always looked at the want ads for his competitors. As long as they were hiring C or Perl people, he didn't worry. Because the way the market worked at the time, because they were using such clunky languages, it would take them weeks to implement a new feature that Paul and his guys could implement in a couple of days. And any feature that they implemented that took them a week would take several months for their competitors to implement. So they had a huge technological advantage. And he said that if he ever saw somebody hiring Python, he would get a little nervous. He said, if I ever saw anybody hiring Lisp, I would have flown into a blind panic because then they would have been at the same technological level as we were, and we would have had to start competing at a business level, not from a huge technological advantage. And so Yahoo came and bought ViaWeb because it was clearly the best of all the build your own e-commerce sites. And they looked at all this weird Lisp code and didn't understand what was there, and so they tore it all down and rewrote it in C. <laughs> the thing that they bought the advantage they didn't understand when they saw it. And so they immediately tore down their technical advantage and built themselves a platform actually a little below their competitors because now they're playing catch up because they're having to re-implement all this stuff in a more broken language. That is the blub paradox. But this actually falls into a lot of things in the computer science world. For example, a lot of people are big, big fans of Subversion and they see the new kids on the block like Git and Mercurial that do distributed version control. And you look at, for example, Git, and you go, well, you know, Git's really good if you need to do coding on an airplane. Well, I don't fly on that many airplanes, so I don't need that. That's just a weird syntax for the stuff I'm already doing. But it's not. That's a blub paradox. Git is a profound rethinking of the way that version control works, and seeing it as just a one step better subversion is missing the entire point. Git is a profoundly different thing that seems to act in a few cases like something you've seen before, but it is very much a different ballgame entirely. So let's go even deeper and talk about some language abstractions. And talk about one of our mo most beloved language abstractions, and it's this idea of inheritance and polymorphism. So let's say we have a point 2D and a point 3D. We know how this works underneath the way the polymorphic uh, draw method will work here, or rather get Z, or rather draw. Uh, so my draw method here, if I don't implement one in point 3D, then there's a pointer that points back to the virtual method table in my parent class and says, well, anytime you call this, then call that one instead. <clears throat> We're very used to this idea of, well, this is how polymorphism inheritance work in Java. But from a technical standpoint, this is really just a coupling technique because it couples these two classes together. So from a pure computer science standpoint, these two things are coupled together in a very well-defined relationship, which is this inheritance polymorphism relationship. So a lot of you are familiar with this book. This is a fantastic book if you're doing Java development because it has a lot of recipes for very useful things in the Java world. And in fact, one of the very useful recipes it has is the recipe for the perfect equals and hash code. So given the little scenario I gave you before, let's do that. So here is an equals for my point 2D and the rule from Josh Block says you do an instance check, then you do a typecast, then you do an equality check, and everything's fantastic. I now understand equality for my 2D points. Now I just need to do this for my 3D points as well. 
But this is where we run into problems because doing a naive implementation of an equals in point 3D doesn't work. This actually violates the symmetry rule in Java that says x equals y must return true if and only if y equals x also returns true and point 2Ds don't know anything about point 3Ds and so they're not symmetrical. Okay, well we can fix that, but when we come in and fix that, we end up violating transitivity, which is the other requirement for equality that says if x equals y returns true and y equals uh, z returns true, then x equals z must also return true. It turns out that in effective Java, Josh Block says, there is no way to extend an instantiable class and add a value component while preserving the equals contract unless you're willing to forego the benefits of the object-oriented abstraction. Well, listening to that from Josh Block makes you kind of think, well, it sounds like object-oriented programming is kind of broken because it doesn't work for simple things like equality. We know that's not true. This is a very, very useful abstraction that we use for all sorts of things all the time. It's not broken at all. In fact, the Scala guys have figured out a way to solve even this little nasty problem, which is by adding a third method, a can equal method, that basically allows things in the hierarchy to comment on whether I should be able to interact with this thing from an equality standpoint or not, or whether you should just ignore the relationship between these guys. The point of this is, that a lot of your abstractions get really, really deeply ingrained and you start to think that that's the way the world works. But that is, in fact, my lesson number six. Your abstraction isn't perfect. It's just the one that you are accustomed to. And in fact, if you look back at this in the Java world and look at the way polymorphic dispatch works, then you look at a language like Clojure, which is this functional lisp that runs on the JVM now. And you get Clojure, and Clojure is not a particularly object-oriented language. In fact, it's all function-based. And a lot of developers look at that and suffer from the blub paradox because they look at that and go, oh, it only has functions. Well, you know, I have classes and objects and a bunch of other stuff, so clearly my thing must be better. But the reason that you think that is because you're used to this arrangement. It turns out that closure actually has polymorphism as well. It's just not coupled to inheritance. You actually get the benefits of inheritance and polymorphism, but you can mix and match them in any way that you want in closure. So it gives you all the building blocks that are already pre-wired together in a language like Java. In fact, there's this mechanism in closure called a multi-method, where you can say this will actually take in multiple kinds of, of uh, uh, possible method signatures, and those are keyed on the first parameter in each of these cases. And in fact, you can even do things like disambiguation. So I have here a collection, let's say that I have this situation where I have a rectangle and a shape, and I have a situation where a rectangle and a shape are related to one another. You can actually come in and close your and say, well, prefer, anytime you run into this ambiguous situation where I have a shape and a rectangle, let's prefer the rectangle and work on the more specific type. And so you can actually change the way that polymorphism calls by saying, well, this one is preferred over this one in the situation where you have a name clash like that. And I want to talk to you for a second about some general characteristics of things that you see out in the world, of things that are rigid versus fluid. And there are lots of examples of these things that are in contrast with one another right now. For example, SQL versus NoSQL. For many, many years, we treated the relational database as the golden hammer. Every problem that's data related must be solved by the golden hammer. But now you're seeing a lot of places use NoSQL to much better effect in some situations. For example, one of our clients is a big giant Oracle shop and they were trying to do this network graph analysis on top of Oracle and they managed to get the query down to about six and a half hours, I think, to do this and they installed Neo4j, which is a graph database and the same query comes back in less than a second on Neo4j because it's a much more suitable kind of format for that job. 
You see a lot of discussion still around things like static versus dynamic typing. It turns out that some of those are beneficial in some cases and some in others. I'm very much in the kind of dynamic, dynamic typing world, but we're seeing actually smarter type inferencing coming to languages like Scala and Java and taking a lot of the kind of uh, housekeeping burden away from having a good, uh, strong static type system. And you see conversations like SOAP versus REST. Both of these have advantages and disadvantages, but REST, in a lot of cases, is a lot more fluid because you're not determining types at your endpoint. You're determining documents. You can have different versions of documents that are delivered by the same kind of endpoint. And so all of these things have implications in the way that you end up designing things. And a lot of times, this becomes an abstraction distraction. You end up optimizing toward one tool or paradigm at the expense of others. And lesson number seven, is all about understanding the implications of rigidity. Sometimes you want rigid things in place because you need verification, but sometimes you need softer verification in place. You need less rigidity there because very often less rigidity gives you more flexibility long term, and flexibility is something that you need in a lot of cases. Here's a great example of that. This is a classic book of Windows programming by Charles Petzl. This is the very first book that showed many, many people how to program Windows. And a lot of you are probably going to react to this pretty innocuous five character string. What is that? An LPSTR? Any old school Windows programmers here? So any Windows API littered throughout the Windows API is Hungarian notation with LPSTR in front of all these variable names, which stands for long pointer to null terminated string, a long pointer to a string. And if you look at this documentation on the Win32 API programming guide, when they talk about Win32 data types, one of the things he says is an LP prefix stands for long pointer. In Win32, the long point is obsolete, so don't worry about it. <laughs> so this was something that existed in Windows 3.1 that made it into Windows 32. And in 10,000 years, when they're running Windows Vista 100 bonus edition, and they're looking at that API, somebody's going to say, what's an LPSTR? They're going to say, no, never mind. That comes from the same place where that save icon comes from. Just don't worry about that. Which brings me right back to lesson number five. Don't name things that expose underlying details. This was the poison of Hungarian notation because you're tying the, the representation to the thing it is. And sometimes those things diverge and you're stuck with a name that always has that detail attached to it. Which gets me right back to lesson number seven, understanding the implications of rigidity. I want to talk for a second about leakiness and leaky abstractions. Joel Spolsky, a very well-known blogger and writer, has a terrific blog entry back a long time ago. I want to say this is the early 2000s, called um, The Law of Leaky Abstractions. And in it, he says, all non-trivial abstractions, to some degree, are leaky. And this is true, that it's never a perfect abstraction. If it was a perfect abstraction, it would just be the thing. It wouldn't be an abstraction at all. An abstraction is always a generalization. And, <coughs> and they always leak. But Joel Spolsky was saying this is, this is always a bad thing. This is always a flaw in an abstraction, that it's leaky. But that's not necessarily the case. My good friend Glenn Vanderberg has a very interesting observation around this that says that when you're talking about leaky abstractions, some leak in better ways than others, and the best abstractions leak intentionally in carefully chosen ways. And in fact, Glenn has coined this term that I love, so I'm going to promulgate it here, this idea of an onion skin API, which is a high level abstraction built on top of an equally well-documented lower level abstraction allowing you to work at either level of abstraction that you need to for a particular problem. And a terrific example of this is Active Record in Ruby on Rails, which exists in five distinct layers of abstraction. At the bottom layer is vendor agnostic database connections and low level facilities for data management. Then you have a query to object instances mapping layer. Then you have a layer that lets you compose SQL fragments into select statements. Then you have high level relational algebra methods that work on uh, result sets. And then you have query instances of particular classes with their associations. This is the stuff that you normally see in tutorials. And in fact, most of the tutorials really just touch on the first level of abstraction here 
But in most non-trivial Rails applications, you'll use all three, at least the top three, at different times for different purposes. Because the guys who wrote Rails said, you know what, solving this ORM problem to the hundredth percent is really, really hard. And we're not even going to bother trying to do that because so much effort is required in the last little bit that it's probably not justified. Instead, we'll just allow our abstraction to leak in very well-known well places so that you can just take over from the framework if you want. Which brings me to lesson number eight, which is a good thing. Good APIs are not merely high level or low level, they're both at the same time. This is one of the reasons that I dearly love Git so much. Because when you interact with Git, you're really interacting with a bunch of shell scripts that compose the little tiny atomic building blocks for Git underneath. But you can get to that lower level of abstraction if you want and wire it up to do all sorts of really, really elaborate things um, once you understand how that lower level of abstraction works. And it turns out that there are lots and lots of things in the computer science world that follow this Pareto distribution, this 80-20 rule. Hibernate's a great example of that. ORM in general is a great example of that. That 80% of that problem is pretty easy to abstract away, but the last 20% is murderously difficult, and that last 1% will probably take more effort than the preceding 99% to get that final bit done. And so what the Rails guys have said, we're not even going to try to get 100%. We're going to get close and allow you ways to get to that last bit that you want. Which is lesson number nine, generalize the 80% cases and get out of the way for the rest of them. It turns out that believing in the wrong abstraction can sometimes be a dangerous thing. and It can lead you to really, really dangerous places. And nobody exemplifies that more than Galileo who definitely believed in the wrong abstraction for his time. Because at, when he was alive, the predominant abstraction about the way the universe looked, looked a lot like this. And Galileo caught this beam from Copernicus that the universe really looked like this. And this did not sit well with the church powers of the day. And Galileo was a very prominent figure in the church. And so they actually hounded him and drove him, cast him out of his community. He was essentially drove nearly insane and died as a penniless pauper. Which brings me to Maven. This is one of my colleagues, Kent Spilner, one of the most easygoing guys you will ever meet. And he wrote a blog back in 2009 that said, Maven bills are an infinite cycle of despair that will slowly drag you into the deepest, darkest pits of hell where Maven itself was forged. <laughs> now, what would make a normally mild-mannered developer feel so passionately against something as innocuous as a technology? It turns out that Maven is one of those things that people either love or hate. It turns out that you uh, either hate Maven or you will eventually hate Maven. And I was wondering why that was. And I did a little bit of analysis on this, and this broadly goes into two categories of things. Composable and contextual things. Composable things are things built out of small parts, whereas contextual things are things built out of frameworks and scaffolding. So, for example, Bash is a good example of a very composable thing versus PowerShell where you still pipe things through pipes, but they come through with properties defined, and you can take advantage of those properties. Things like Rake or Gantt are both language-based versus Ant or Maven, which are both plug-in-based. And I've come to believe that builds are uh, particular enough that you can't get enough flexibility with plugins. You need to go all the way to language to do that. Even low-level tools like editors, like Emacs or VI versus Eclipse or Visual Studio. If you talk to anyone who uses Emacs or VI and ask them, have you made some little programmatic change to your environment in the last week, chances are pretty good that that's true. I use Emacs all the time, and I made a little tweak to my .emacs file over this last week. But how many people who use Eclipse or Visual Studio have made any changes to that environment outside the preferences dialog? 
The problem is you have to understand a week's worth of context at least to even create a hello world window in something like Eclipse. There's an enormous amount of power there, but it's all in this giant hierarchy of interrelated things, and you have to understand all that context before you can get anything done in that environment. And it's so daunting, you just never bother. And ultimately, languages are composable and frameworks are not. And these both have different characteristics because things that have provide a lot of context give you more capabilities out of the box. They're, they're much easier to use. And they give you more contextual intelligence, but they tend to be less flexible over time. Versus things that are composable tend to give you less implicit behavior, but better building blocks for sophisticated behavior, and thus more eventual power, less, eventual, uh, less initial power, but greater flexibility down the road. And this all kind of rubber meets the road. It's something, a, a phrase that I coined called Dietzler's Law. This was something that I coined in my book, The Productive Programmer, and it's based on some observations. The company that I worked for before ThoughtWorks was a company that did the training consulting in a variety of technologies. And one of the things that we did the consulting projects on was Microsoft Access. And we eventually shut down that part of the business because it turned out that every Access project started out as a booming success and always ended in failure. And we wondered why that was, and Terry Dietzler was the guy who ran the access part of the business, and we codified this as Dietzler's Law, and here it is. Using some tool or framework like access, and you look at what the user wants, using some framework like that, getting 80% of what the user wants is blazingly fast and super easy. It's a stunning how fast you can get to the 80% point, and your clients love you. You're a miracle worker. Then the next 10% they want is possible but difficult because now you're having to work around the abstraction and you're kind of having to hack it and you know, do something it wasn't meant to do, but you have to get it to do that. But then the last 10% is flat out impossible because you can't get far enough under the framework or the abstraction. And it turns out that users always want 100% of what they want. They're never satisfied with 90% of what they want. And so tools like Access always fail at the very last because you cannot bend them enough to make them work. Remember back in the late 1990s, we had all these fourth generation languages, these four GLs, FoxPro and Clipper and DBase and uh, Paradox and Power Builder. All those tools eventually died and we went back to general purpose programming languages because they all suffered from Dietzler's law. At some point, you could never get far enough underneath them to build really general purpose stuff, and so we ended up back at general purpose languages. But see, this is a really tricky thing because how do you choose something? Well, you want to start with the easiest, no-brainerest decision, and Maven is a classic example of this because when you start a brand new project, you want something that's opinionated because you don't have a lot of opinions. This is a brand new thing. And so somebody coming in and saying, your directory structure shall look like this, it's like, okay, sure. You've got an opinion about this and I don't, so I'll take your opinion. That it is dogmatic and rigid are good things because that along with that rigidity comes the ability to say, hey, I want to take the sonar plug-in and the fine bugs plug-in and those things all work really great right out of the box. Like, man, this is fantastic. But then over time, your project becomes less and less generic and more and more specific. It is inevitable that your project, as it ages and becomes more and more capable, will get more and more specific and the things that were advantages early on start turning into disadvantages. When your opinion starts differing from the opinion of the tool about fundamental things like when should we compile things versus when should we instrument things, then you start fighting with the tool. Uh, the rigidity that was really useful at first becomes a straitjacket later on. This is a classic example of a wall that eventually becomes a prison. And tools like this always reach a tipping point. And once it goes over the edge of this tipping point, it is never, ever going to be wonderful again.
I hate to tell you this, but if you've already started fighting with Maven, you're never going to kiss and make up. It's just going to get more acrimonious and more and more hateful as time goes on. But this is really tough because you really like having all that capability early on, and so you really have to decide at what point do you cut and run. Fortunately, some of these things come with escape clauses or escape hatches. Maven is a good example of that. Gradle, which is this tool that has recently come out, which is language-based but still talks to Maven repositories, is a way out because it replaces the really rigid, unbending parts of Maven with a part that is less rigid, changing the plug-in parts for language parts. And so in some cases, there are ways to get out of these. And I'm not even saying you shouldn't use Maven. You should absolutely start new projects with Maven, but understand the limitations of the technology. As soon as you start fighting with it, don't start bending your practices toward it. Bend it towards your practices. And if it won't bend, find something that is more bendable that will do that. And in fact, Maven's also interesting because it exemplifies almost all of my bad patterns and does not exemplify my two good ones. I actually wrote this up. If anybody wants this as evidence for work, I have a blog on why everyone eventually hates or leaves Maven. So I've been talking about all these abstractions, mostly as kind of a bad thing or as a cautionary tale. Is there one, one true abstraction? Is there one that seems to work and solve problems and have very few downsides? Probably not. But if there is, it is probably composability. Because if you look at some of the problems I posed earlier, this is exactly the solution of the problem that Josh Block posed in his book. He didn't just leave it with, oh yeah, and Java's broken, sorry. Next chapter is about he said, no, you solve this problem by not using inheritance, use composition instead. This is a really common refrain in object-oriented languages is prefer composition to inheritance. As I mentioned before, this is one of the reasons I love Git so much because Git is an onion skin API. And notice that this idea of onion skin API is really this idea of composition as uh, kind of written as an API. This also explains why we see such interest right now in domain-specific languages. Because domain-specific languages now are fitting in the exact same category that four GLs fit in back in the late 90s, with one key difference. The four GLs in the late 90s were built as unique languages, whereas these internal DSLs like Ruby on Rails or EasyB or Grails are all built on top of general purpose languages, creating onion skin APIs so that if you're in Ruby on Rails and you need to dip down below the abstraction, you can because it's just written on top of the low level general purpose language. So that's where things like 4GLs have gone. They have become internal DSLs, and we're getting the same benefits that we had with 4GLs in terms of greater context without paying such a steep price. Because it's an onion skin API, we can drop down and get to those lower level pieces as we need to. So I'm sure some of you are dying to know how I eventually solved the Mary Long chocolate cake problem. I ended up solving it by storing it in Unicode, I feel pretty confident there, in Markdown, which is easy to create into HTML if you want to, um, but you don't have to, it's still very readable. And in terms of backups, I have a RAID drive at home, and I do an external snapshot of that offsite, and I use CrashPlan out in California. Uh, because I've used computers for a long time, and the only reasonable backup strategy is one that I refer to as belt, suspenders, and duct tape. Because it's not a question of if your computer is going to lose that data, it's a question of when, and I'm worried about that abstraction. I've always made sure that it is backed up very, very well. And I'll leave you with my last lesson, which is number 10, don't be distracted by your abstractions. I have just one last piece of advice for you. Please enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks very much for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much.